Godard, Lindsay, welcome to the show. It's good, it's good to have you on Crownsman Egg. Um, I, I guess my first question for the year, it's I'm still a for, first quarter, so I can ask this question. Uh, has uh, it, it been a busy year for Verge Egg to kick off 2022? So far, yes. Yeah, thanks for having us on the show. Yeah, it's going to be, we've got, we've got a ton of stuff to cover. Um, I guess, Godard, I just quickly, can you just give me sort of the overview of what Verge Egg is, is offering? And then uh, we'll jump it over to our sponsors and, and dig into it a bit. Sure. So we offer software that helps farmers plan, simulate, and validate the movement of equipment in field and allow them to efficiently uh, execute their field operations. So end of the day, we're providing farmers the tools required to assess both the economic and environmental impact associated with every time they enter the field with mechanized equipment. Well, I will say that over the last uh, couple of years, uh, kicking off this egg show, I, I've learned how much progress has been make, made in the agriculture sector. So it's going to be great to get into it. Uh, first, um, we're going to, before we kick off the interview, we got to give a shout out to a few of our sponsors. So um, first off, we've got Mino. Mino works closely with customers to make biochar from their waste streams. This biochar is then used to increase agriculture yields, to improve forest productivity, or to store carbon in materials such as concrete or asphalt. Through the production of increased use of biochar, Mino's goal is to accelerate the rate of which humanity removes carbon from the atmosphere, improves the health of salt, of soil and water resources, and in the process, create good jobs of the future. Uh, learn more at myocarbon, minocarbon, sorry, myocarbon, we'll bring that up on the screen, or check our Crownsman Agriculture interview with Mino CEO, Thord Kalistad. We covered some interesting ground in that one. Uh, Zero Knox. Zero Knox is the global leader for electric powertrain solutions, microgrids, and clean technology. We provide a platform for clean energy technology to come to market through powertrain solutions, development partnerships, and electrification kit solutions for conversions, all powered by Zero Knox. Our mission is to empower communities through sustainable innovation as we partner with the world some of the world's leading OEMs to solve challenges across multiple continents with cleaner and higher performing technology, empowering a clean, innovative, and higher performing future without compromise. Learn more at zeronox.com. And lastly, SolarSet. SolarSet has launched pre-assembled ground-mounted solar systems, including the innovative SolarSet Fold, our solar system will power your residential and commercial property, and we ship worldwide. Talk to our team to learn if a grid tie or off-grid with battery backup solar system is the right for your application. Visit solarset.com to learn more. Thank you very much. I, I do miss Gaudi, and she will be back to do the ad reads, because I'm sure you miss her too. Okay. Goodard, Lindsay, welcome. Welcome again to the show, to, Crown, uh, to Crownsman Egg. Uh, let's just kick off with sort of your roles at, at Verge Egg. Uh, Lindsay, I'll start off with you. Sounds good. Uh, thanks for having us on the show today. Uh, so I'm the marketing manager at Verge Agriculture. Um, I run and execute all the marketing efforts um, globally. Um, so focus on North America, but also work with our partners um, around the world to promote um, our software innovation for agriculture. It's, it's an in, interesting um, when you've got sort of this new and innovative technology and we've got some case studies we're going to get into. Is it, is, it, uh, is it still quite a mixture? Is most of it now online, online focus or is there still quite a mixture of sort of on that on the ground marketing strategy coming from your side? It varies because we're a SaaS based product. We do tend to do a lot of our marketing digitally. Uh, but there's still a market out there for that traditional type of marketing. Um, you know, farmers still get guides and there's a lot of farm shows out there that you would need brochures for and so forth. So it's, it's a mix, um, but we do uh, tend to spend most of our money online um, just to reach a broader audience um, and um, ensure that uh, they understand that um, it's a, a, self a self-service solution. Right. Um, so, so with doing that, um, marketing online is, is probably our most important at this point. 
Yeah, it's sort of a, when it's when it's this type of software and that it's sort of the reverse. If you meet them in person, you've got to then switch them to the online as opposed to uh, if it's a physical like a product like a tractor or something. Now you've got to do it the reverse. So it's kind of an interesting um, thing. But uh, Goddard, can I just uh, what, what's your day to day with Verjag? Well, my, my role is really running the internal operations of the company. So I'm mostly 80 percent internally focused and you know 20 percent externally uh, talking to investors and you know potential partners, but internally my role is uh, keeping an alignment with the product team that's developing the software and understanding sort of that product market fit, and then the commercial side of the house, which is you know marketing and sales. Okay, we're going to keep it with you, Godard. Um, can you just sort of, I guess, a really simple question: Why the focus? Where Verge is sort of narrowed in on? Why that specific focus? Yeah, so if you look at, you know, trends and reports uh, coming in specifically even in Canada, uh, you can see that farmers are losing money on every acre they farm, right? You, you remove government subsidies, the net farm income is almost zero. So our business is really about bringing automation to the farm that can help them be more efficient, increase their output, you know, lower their costs, and also have a positive impact on the environment. Lindsay, the, this e, just kind of touching on the economic impact of farmers, I guess a two-part question. Since you sort of, can you kind of unpack that economic impact, but also sort of your approach to communicating that economic impact? Yeah, absolutely. So as you mentioned, it is two-pronged. Um, so the impacts on the agriculture industry, especially farming, is your economic and then your environmental. So if we look at the economic piece, um, with what Godard said in creating efficiencies on the farm, uh, the number one thing that that's, that's helping with is saving time. And as we know in farming, time is so important when it comes to weather uh, and harvesting and so forth. Uh, second to that is reducing input costs. So input costs have been uh, on the rise for years. Uh, most recently, I'll, I'll touch upon a little bit later on how machinery has surpassed that. Um, but with the technology that we have and reducing uh, overlap, you're actually maximizing um, your, your input costs. So uh, that's another big piece there from an economic perspective. And then the last piece is the better coordination and utilization of the equipment. So again, having the path plans that, that we're creating in our software launch pad, um, the, the equipment in the field is moving more cohesively. Um, and then you have your contract operators just following one set of lines. Um, so then it becomes uh, more of a, a seamless coordination. So overall, what this is doing is it's helping farmers save money which is impacting their net farm income. And the second piece uh, or the, the second prong in that is the environmental impacts. Um, so obviously with sustainability being at the forefront um, globally uh, with regards to our software, focusing on the equipment uh, and the impacts that it has in the field, uh, we're considering the soil value and the soil health. Um, so if you think about it, if you have multiple pieces of equipment entering the field at multiple times during a growing season, if it's not planned properly, then that can lead to soil compaction. And so um, if, if your soil compaction uh, is present uh, and there's damages to your soil uh, structure, then the soil health will be degraded. So the soil won't have the ability to hold water, uh, nutrients or air that's necessary to support crop, uh, crop life. And so if you're your soil is in good health and your crops aren't going to be in, in the greatest health e either. Uh, looking globally too into other regions that are, are possibly more hilly, um, mm. elevation plays a part in that too. So um, if you look at other areas around the world uh, where there's heavy rainfall um, in how it impacts the soil, um, if you're comp compacting it with the equipment going in and out of the field and it's not planned properly, then this would also lead to soil erosion. Something I'm, I was curious about when, when both you were talking and it came to my mind is, you know, that, you know, the kind of silly saying, you don't know what you don't know, um, is the, do, do farmers, do they know where they're, where they're losing um, economically? Do they see where they can be more responsible environmentally, or do you have to actually provide that education as well? I, I, either one of you that can take that question. Um, it, it is a bit of both. I think, you know, if you look at South America, specifically Brazil, um, you know, path planning of equipment is 
a very known thing. Uh, you know, they have high terrain areas where, you know, rainfall, you know, ponding, water accumulation, all of these are factors that they need to uh, be concerned about due to which they need to really plan complex paths that the equipment need to take, whether that is, you know, contour farming or curved paths. But then there are areas of the field where, you know, they've never really considered that because, you know, field shape is rectangular and they think that, yeah, we'll just bring the equipment in and operators can start at one end of the field and figure things out. So, you know, there are parts of the world where they know this is a concern and there are other parts of the world where they haven't thought about it as a concern, but, you know, when you look at it as percentage improvements, 1% to 5% improvements, you know, over a single operation, field after field, year over year, can start adding up and lead to a massive uh, impact on the economic side. Um, Godard, I've got, I'd like to stick with you on this. Could you, could you start, I, I want to kind of run through um, that the, the actual technology, sort of, just sort of break it down. Can you, can you sort of walk us through it um, from, a, from a technical approach and, and a sort of a user approach as well? For sure. So uh, we are a team, you know, a very unique team the, comprised of maybe farmers or investors, you know, are there are entrepreneurs, there are software developers, you know, product managers that have served the agriculture industry for a long time, and then aerospace engineers and rocket scientists in the team. And we're all collaborating together to create this new customer category, which is around enabling farmers to plan their field operations using a very intuitive and interactive software. So this software is web-based. It's a web application, uh, can be accessed from anywhere in the world, uh, there's no user manual for our software. End of the day, we want it to be like any other productive productivity software that you use in your daily lives, like any planning app or task management app. We wanted to design and build this geospatial software to take users through a very unique experience so that planning their field operations feels less like work and more like play. So a, a lot of the design components here has been taken from game design. You know, mm. uh, gaming gaming is a fun thing, right? Um, and there's a company called Superhuman and, and the CEO of that company has you know, very well illustrated how game design can now be applied to business software so that it feels a lot like, you know, play and less like work. So our app, when you access it or a farmer accesses it, it starts with setting a goal. Right, our users are shown a dashboard of all of their fields. So it's a map representing all their fields. We try to highlight some of their most complex fields. So immediately we're taking the user and their attention to planning for those fields that are more complex, right? And within two clicks, they're now you know, visualizing the precise paths that their equipment needs to take in that specific field, whether that was for you know, tillage, seeding, spraying, harvest, right? So, um, and then they can start focusing on specific goals. You know, should I be minimizing the number of passes I take in the field? Uh, should I manage my overlapping passes so that when I'm planting the entire field, my partial passes are on edges where it makes the least negative uh, impact. Uh, so there's a variety of factors that they can start setting goals for. And, and the second aspect, from goals is providing them the controls necessary to set these goals, right? As I said, there's, there's many factors that farmers and operators care about. Uh, so we needed to create controls and toys such that each decision made by the user is very inherently satisfying and interesting. So we have a slider that you can kind of, you know, glide through and see the track direction change. And based on the change of track direction, we're providing them valuable information about okay, how does 45 degrees mean in terms of the number of passes in the field or the time it takes for me to complete that operation, mm. right? A, a very interesting example is, you know, soybeans. When you plant soybeans, you could pick a direction, whether that's north, south or east, west, or at a particular angle, right? You plant the crop, but when you go to harvest it, you need to harvest that at an angle so that it's easy to pick up the crop. So what is that ideal angle? How do you determine that ideal angle? And sometimes the field shape is so complex that it is impossible for a human brain 
to determine what that optimal angle needs to be. Mm. So we provide them these tools to determine what that optimal angle is. And they can figure that out based on, okay, I care about completing this field as quickly as possible. Or I don't care about completing this field as quickly as possible because I care about preserving the long-term soil value. So I want to pick a direction that leads to the least soil loss overall. I just, and I want to quickly, where, oh, yeah, so, uh, sorry, go ahead. I'll, I'll ask my question after. And, and, you know, as I said, there's goals, there's controls, and, and we kind of combine this together with flow. And flow is the most, you know, important aspect of game design, right? You're taking someone through a journey where the experience is designed to make, help you make decisions, right? And so we, we make sure that there, there aren't too many buttons or distractions in the app. Like every page, you basically have, you know, two decisions you need to make. So you've seen a path plan. Should I save that path plan because I like it and I want to go to the next field? Or do I want to compare that path plan with something else that I've done before or how I've implemented it in the field before so that I know that, you know, a decision that I'm saving has been thought through fully, right? So the next action in the app is very obvious. And that's why, you know, flow comes in. So end of the day, we don't need a user manual. We've created it such that someone's just going through a journey and interacting with the app. And it's very inherently satisfying and interesting because the user is the one making decisions as opposed to the app doing it for them. I, I wanted to just quickly understand something. So I'm looking, cause I've, I've got this, uh this image in front that's sort of switching and showing different data points. Um, how does that information, like like day one, I, I'm a farmer in Brazil. I, I find out about your app and I, I log in and begin the process. What are those initial, what, what's the first hour of my time? What are, you, what are you inputting into the app? What is the data that's needed? How do you get the, this thing going to that where, where we're seeing here on the screen with all this information? Yeah, great question. So the someone entering the app, we wanted to make sure that they, they're taken right away to where they are, right? So if you're from Brazil logging in and you're a John Deere user, you can actually not even create a local Launchpad account. You can synchronize uh, with your Launchpad, uh, sorry, John Deere Operations Center account and we bring in all of your field boundaries automatically. Oh, wow. So while you're signing up, within seconds, what you're seeing are your fields. So immediately you're taken to your fields, you're not even searching for it, right? So now you're in your world, you know your fields very well, and you know that, yeah, that field at the north end has always given me trouble. Let me click that. And then our product hook is once you click on a field, we wanted them to visualize the path plan immediately. So two clicks, you see the path plan. That's that's our product hook, which is that single interaction that the user engages in again and again, right? Oh. And 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 that, that's how. And and if you're not a John Deere customer and you're from let's say Ukraine and you sign up for our app, what we provide are template fields in Ukraine to you, right? So you kind of feel that local, uh, uh, you know, localized experience that you know you're not giving your field in the U.S. when you're in Ukraine. Um, and, and, you know, our future plan is that we, we allow them to just enter the city and just simply draw your own field boundary over a map, right? Right. And, and start planning right away. Now, so, what about what about the what about what is being planted? Like you say, soybeans. Now, does that is if you're uh, if you're going through the John Deere system, then does that does it automatically know what's being or do you have to input what you're planting in that and then it pulls some other data? Just sort of how does that whole setup work? Uh, so that's an interesting question because you're right. Most farmers will be thinking from a crop perspective, right? I'm, I'm planting these different crops this growing season. I've got canola, you know, um, cereals or, or uh, whatever. But we want we we knew that asking them that question would bring in an extra step of can you input the crop, right? And we didn't want to have them input too many things. Mm. We just wanted them to click and go on. So we thought, okay, what if we flip the question around rather than focusing on the crop, let's focus on the equipment you're gonna to use to plant that. Oh. Is that equipment 60 feet wide, 80 feet wide? Just enter that and click next, right? Right. So it, because they know which crop they would be planting 
it, it didn't make sense for us to ask that question at this point. We can bring that in later because the goal is to get them to achieve that inside breakthrough that they've, they've hooked with the product and they're seeing data that they haven't thought about before. And once you achieve that inside breakthrough, then you want to enter into that transaction again and again. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. Now that that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the uh, Lindsay, I'd like to go over to you and just talk a little bit um, about, obviously there's this, I mean, <laughs> across all industries and we host a few shows of across, you know, energy and mining and agriculture and that, and just all within that sort of heavy industry space. And there's obviously this huge demand um, for technology and data and information. I, I going down to the core of it. Why? I, I, again, two part question. Why do the customer? Why do the farmers need to care about it? But also, how do you communicate it to them so that they do care about it? Absolutely. Um, and again, just just touching on you know the the income and the and the environmental crisis that that we're having, and so. Um, you know, taking into consideration the rising of costs on the farm and then looking at the sustainability of it, um, it's important to, to farmers to, you know, control their variable costs because they already have so many fixed costs in place. Um, so if you look at this, this diagram here with the, with the line chart, um, and if we're talking about net farm income crisis, um, this is primarily due to the increased cost of production. Um, so based on multi-year trends provided by the USDA, Machinery costs have climbed um, at faster rates uh, in absolute amounts that exceed all other production factors. So farm machinery has been on a, a steady increase at about 3.3% uh, annually for the last two decades. Um, in 2013 and 14, average seed costs exceeded machinery costs and fertilizer costs were about 50% higher than the machinery costs. But today we're seeing that machinery costs are over one third higher than seed costs and 10% higher than fertilizer costs. So uh, if you look at that on a per acre basis, um, this is the inverse of Moore's law. It's um, you know money buys less and less productivity over time. So the second piece of that uh, is the, uh, the environmental crisis. Um, so talking about emissions, um, Agricultural emissions make up 12% uh, of total Canadian emissions or emissions worldwide, of which fertilizer, machinery, fuel accounts for about 50% of that. So the costs that we're mentioning earlier associated with the use of equipment uh, inputs such as seed, chem and fertilizer all contribute to about 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. So if you look at the direct correlation of the crisis, um, you know, looking at uh, the solution of, of the impacts of both, um, with greater efficiency comes reduced costs and increased your net farm income. So if you look at that acre by acre, field by field, farm by farm, um, this aggregated economy impact will also drive long-term sustainability with reduced use of ec um, equipment and inputs such as seed, chem, and fertilizer. What is, um... Godard, can we sort of tack on to that? By the way, Lindsay, I, I appreciate that there was actual numbers there because so often on the show, I'm, I'm asking people and, and I, I saw the notes you provided beforehand. It's very nice to have real data and information to go to the show because that's what people love. So um, I want to switch over to Godard the next five to 10 years, though, where putting all that data together and then seeing what Verge Ag where that because I could see on that chart the impact of 25 percent what does that look like going forward now as you bring in things like auto, more automation into farming um, can you sort of give us a scope uh, of what that could look like in the next five to ten years yeah for sure you know we we thought about this as uh, for us to think about economic impact and sustainability impact and clearly communicate why that matters end of the day buying decisions on software or anything is always based on, can I make more money, right? And if that, we can provide a solution to that, which is, you know, provide a positive economic impact to the grower. And that solution ends up solving the climate crisis or the sustainability crisis in this case, 
then that's going to drive good behavior. So we think over the next five to 10 years, you know, grain production is going to experience the benefits of automation um, that other industries have experienced in the last decade or two. Um, so we, we started with the future in mind, right? We, we knew that we wanted to create a planning software that can be used, um, whether the equipment's manned or autonomous. And then we work backwards in time to find breakthroughs that can be exponentially different and unique. So for that, we need different inflections to happen over that time period. So equipment's smart today. You know, there's auto steering and, you know, high precision guidance receivers. So the adoption of that can be considered one inflection point. You know, the availability of satellite imagery or, you know, easy to map fields gives us the ability to characterize fields and boundaries, which is another inflection, right? As that becomes better and better, uh, you know, the adoption of um, uh, technology that allows you to characterize your fields uh, becomes easier. So our, our real goal is to challenge the status quo here, right? Which is planning the movement of equipment was not an option before. And what can we do to make this sort of your part of someone's day-to-day -day life, right? Think about it, plan beforehand, and then enter your field, make less decision while that machine is on. So, so far we've used techniques like, you know, customer development to achieve product market fit. And the next step for us to really is to, you know, iterate and innovate our product to understand the distribution channels that we need to tackle mm. and uh, how to acquire users so that we can achieve that global breakthrough that we want. It's always interesting when I'm having these discussions that uh, it's, uh, because one day this will be like standard practice. Um, and we've got, we get a lot of those types of discussions where you're talking about it today, 10 years from now, this is going to be a standardized thing. You'd never, you know, 10 years from now, you're going to have this massive field where you're just driving around on the pattern you think might be the best. <laughs> it just, it won't happen. I mean, it's just, it's all an obvious demand. Um, and I just wanted to clarify with you, Lindsay, who are the customers? I mean, I'm, I'm guessing they're farmers, but I just sort of wanted to clarify it, sort of the scope of, of who you're actually, um, I guess, who has the most impact? Is it, you know, the scale of farmers, the size, the areas, those types of things? Yeah, it depends where you are globally. As, as Goodard mentioned earlier, um, it comes down to who's operating that machine. Uh, we're finding that in North America, for example, the farmers or the growers are the ones that are finding the most value in the product. Um, mind you, when we're marketing, you know, the messaging has to be curated to the different regions um, based on who the target audience is. Um, so again, in North America, with farmers being our target audience of Launchpad um, technology, they're the ones that are planning the operations, they're the ones analyzing, comparing, and are looking at the holistic approach of, of the farm operation in general. Um, but then if you take into consideration, um, you know, the global audience uh, farms, say, for example, in regions such as Argentina, um, where growers are more focused on the agronomy side, uh, and then they hire subcontractors to come in and they do the planting, seeding and harvest. Um, then in, in that case, um, you know, a, a second primary audience would be those um, contract operators um, mm -hmm. or the custom equipment operators, as we have on the chart here. So right. they're the ones that are the real users in that case. So it, it just varies depending on, on the region that they're in. Um, but yes, it would be it would come down to who is who is operating the equipment and is responsible for the the running the logistics of the farming operation. Uh, Goodard, could you could you expand on those secondary uh, customers a little bit? Yeah. So we, you know, obviously, we developed the software keeping the farmers in mind. You know, that's where we wanted the value to be. Right. Uh, they're the ones who always think about. Uh, crops and farming. Uh, but as we developed the software, we also realized um, that the, the same benefits can be articulated in a certain way to open up a secondary customer segment that potentially could be you know, used as a distribution channel as well. And two that really come to mind for us um, are you know, equipment dealers. So these are um, you know, dealership uh, entities in you know, different regions of the world. Uh, so every region would have like a John Deere dealer or a Case New Holland dealer or a Claus mm -hmm. dealer, right? And their primary purpose is to sell equipment to the farmer. Now using the same 
product, which is our product launch pad, you can start matching the size and functionality of equipment to the scope and complexity of a particular farming operation, right? You know, rather than showing a brochure of John Deere and saying, okay, this latest X9 combine is going to cover this many acres per hour, you can actually show the value of that X9 combine on the customer's field by running a simulation on our software, right? So it's a very customized selling. You know, you could say, okay, over your entire farm, your total overlap is about 5,000 acres. You know, you should start investing in row and section control so that you're not putting excess seed, cam, or fertilizer. Or, you know, you need to invest in high precision guidance uh, so that you don't have too many skips or, you know, path inaccuracies in the field. So it becomes a sales enablement tool for equipment dealers. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other customer segment are the landowners. So globally, um, you know, land is really owned by, you know, either big, big corporations or, or you know, few, few individuals. And they lease this land out to, to farmers who want to use that for a few years, right? Um, for landowners, what's more important is the long-term value of the land. And mm -hmm. the only, only factor that indicates the long-term value of an agricultural land is the health of the soil. So you could see them using our software to evaluate the long-term consequences of machine operations on soil value and start stipulating operational constraints on lease agreements. Right. You know, our, our investor, Fall Line, uh, Fall Line Capital from Silicon Valley, they, they invest in agriculture technology like ours, but they also invest in farmland. And what, allow, what ACTEC allows them to do is start you know, drafting their lease agreements in such a way that whoever is using their farmland is not really destroying it from a soil health perspective, right? So you can right. say, never travel at a 45 degree angle on this field because when we get rainfall, you're gonna just cause soil erosion or water is gonna accumulate on this parts of the field where we have not designed waterways, right? So they can, they can start, you know, uh, providing those constraints, which they don't, which they otherwise could not do without our software, right? And then if you want to go buy new land, you can start, you know, just looking at the map and you know, drawing a field boundary and seeing, okay, what, what are the spatial characteristics of this land? Is the terrain crazy? Uh, do I want to buy land, whether it's more, you know, flat, mm -hmm. so that I don't need to be concerned about, um, you know, rainfall and soil erosion? So you can see how landowners can start benefiting from the same. Did those secondary customers, um, when when Verge started, did that was that all was that all part of the plan, or did some of those secondary opportunities? I mean, the the equipment dealer and the landowners. That seems like a pretty, uh, especially the equipment dealer side. That seems like a really key segment. Uh, let's a big secondary. <laughs> I would, I guess, I'd say. Um, was that always there? As part of the approach, uh, I wish. <laughs> no, this this, no. this is all part of the learning, right? Right. It yeah. Was, it was you know you go through the customer discovery process and you understand that you know you build it for something, but you know fundamentally you need to ask yourself three questions, right? Who's going to buy the software? Who gets the most value out of the software? And who uses the software? And when we asked ourselves those questions these four categories came up, right? Growers, landowners, equipment dealers, and, and custom equipment operators, right? Mm -hmm. So now it's all about packaging it such that it is relevant to these different segments. And, you know, we, we take an approach of, if we want to go globally with this product, um, you know, our CEO, Ryan and I, uh, you know, we coined this term in our past business where we owned and operated imaging satellites and we were the third largest optical remote sensing company in the world, which we, uh, you know, exited to Planet Labs in 2015. And we did business in over 90 countries. And the key to, you know, being able to be successful in over 90 countries was establishing a global channel partner network that focused on, you know, we said three L's. And that's partners that can bring in the local relationships, uh, the local investments, and the local knowledge, right? Mm. Sitting here in Canada, you know, I don't speak Portuguese. I don't understand the farming practices in Brazil. Um, and I don't understand how, you know, money moves around in that country, right? So being able to find a channel partner that can understand the market, understand the farming personas, and understanding who can get value out of the product is key. 
So, you know, we look at each country and identify channel partners that we can onboard that can help us get market traction in that geography. Mm -hmm. Um, can we just, while we're just sort of on that, that global reach, can we talk a little bit about the, the market size just to sort of give the, the listeners a scope of, of what we're actually talking about here? Mm -hmm. So we started off by sizing the market as not, not something as, you know, a target market, but we looked at it as, okay, what would our potential market be, right? Because you're creating a new customer category. It's pretty hard to look at, okay, agriculture is worth, you know, I don't know trillions a year and then work backwards so we, we needed to identify okay who are the early adopters of auto steering and gps and farming operations right and what are those key geographies so if you look at canada us brazil argentina the cis region which is primarily ukraine russia and kazakhstan mm -hmm. and then australia and and find the data of those early adopters that use auto steering and gps and farming operations you see that you know, it's about 650 million acres of cropland. Now we see this market increasing in the next five years where, you know, with increased adoption of auto steering and GPS in these specific geographies, we see this going from 650 million acres to about 890 million acres. I see. Right? And then you span it out another five years and start including key geographies like India and China where adoption of mechanized equipment, precision agriculture, and you know, some of them are small farm holdings. So when farms start getting consolidated, those markets open up for us. And then the potential market could be as big as you know, 1.7 billion acres worldwide. And you know, the way we priced it, that's, that's about $850 million in annual recurring revenue available in that market. That, that's a massive market, right? But today, we have over $300 million plus annual recurring revenue SOM, which is a serviceable, obtainable market that's ready to adopt. Well, um, just sort of, as sort of get to the tail end, I, I think uh, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't. Let's touch on a couple um, because you, you've have, you have a couple of case studies. Can we just, um, and, and one of them is actually fairly, fairly close to home here in Saskatchewan, not here in Saskatchewan, BC, but in Canada. <laughs> So uh, can you just touch on a couple of case studies, maybe starting with that one? Yeah, for sure. Um, so this is, you know, we, we wanted to put together a table that, uh, you know, very simply articulated value, right? And, and focused on one thing as opposed to showing, you know, 20 different things that, that, that we add value for. So this is, you know, an example, 30,000 acres farm in Saskatchewan. Uh, they started using our product in 2020, uh, just when we released it. And they, you know, have so far used it for planning two complete growing seasons. So uh, 2020 and 2021, and they will be continuing in 2022 as well. And if you just focused on the harvest operation alone, uh, you can see that we've provided year over year savings, right? And then that's the aspect, which is not just year one, the fact that you want to come back and continuously improve your operations year over year, that was key for us. So you find that you know, inefficiencies in the first year, which is, uh, you know, 2020. And then you go, okay, well, what else can I work on to continue to improve in the following year? Do you invest in high accuracy boundaries? Do you invest in higher accuracy guidance receivers? Or do you focus on, you know, operators and labor where you were making more decisions in fields so you want to reduce or eliminate those in-field decision-making, right? So once the engine is on, you really want to focus on getting that equipment to work and not sit idle, right? Uh, there's not a lot of impact we can have on transport time. So if you look in this chart, machine utilization can be split into three categories. One is working utilization, which is when it's actually you know, spraying or when it's harvesting or when it's you know, planting. The other one is transport, which is when you're going from field to field or even within a field, you know, you've ran out of fuel and you're going to the corner of the field to kind of refill that's considered transport. And then the third aspect is idle time, which is when the engine is on and you're doing nothing and maybe you're talking, right? So our goal is to really reduce the idle time and increase the working time. And idle time is often very really reflective of in-field decision-making, right? Mm -hmm. You're cross-checking with your other operators, you know, not knowing oh, which path should I take next, 
oh, where did you start? You know, should I start here? If we can eliminate all of that and reduce the idle time, they spend that time working, right? So when your engine's on and it's consuming fuel and engine hours, you want it to be working most of the time. And what this you know, chart provides is, you know, year one, they've, they've seen about, um, you know, 9% savings uh, in uh, fuel savings uh, in 2020, and then about a 5% say, uh, increase in working utilization, right? Uh, that's that's pretty big for a thirty thousand acre farm. Yeah. And then in twenty twenty one, they've saved about twenty five percent in fuel, and the working utilization still increased uh, well, by another percent, right? Or six percent actually from from the previous year. So uh, that's you know big step changes in in just harvest, right? Now you bring in uh, spraying, and on average on a Canadian farm you go and apply crop protection three times during the year. So you're entering three, three times to spray. And then of course you're planting at the beginning of the season or applying some early fertilizer before you plant. So it's about five to six times you enter the field with equipment. And if you're able to bring this 5% saving each of those times, it starts adding up from field to field, you know, equipment to equipment. And when you start consolidating this across the entire farm, uh, that's massive savings. In, in, in an example, 30,000 acre farm. Yeah, I had to, uh, I just quickly scrolled back to see because uh, the, the manager side of me had to go back and then look at the 3.3 annual cost increase. The fertilization cost is going up 50%. So if you're cutting down fuel by uh, 25%, <laughs> it's a pretty important number. <laughs> to it say is, the least. And, and it, it's an understatement. Yeah. It, it, it adds up, right? That's 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 the that's the part. Is uh, it's hard to look at a farm and say, okay, I I want to focus on thirty five percent improvements right off the bat. I think you need to start splitting this down into single activities, mm-hmm. and then show that you know when you add all of this up, that's that's where the maximum yeah, that's where it is. Yeah. happens. Yeah, um, I just want to sort of just be again before we wrap up. Um, you, you talked to, talked a little bit about you know uh, autonomous, which you sort of already touched on it. But just again, you know, you're you're in the industry. Um, I guess I, I actually I'm going to Lindsay. I'm going to quickly jump over to you um, before I get into that part. Is just to say, as you've are you pushing as you're pushing out marketing content and and developing that engagement. Have you seen a shift? Have you seen a an increase in demand where it's not as much you trying to send the message out as people looking for that message? Um, or is it still at that stage where you're having to push that message out so that, you know, sort of educate people? It's a very interesting question. Um, <clears throat> so there's, I guess, looking at the market in general, there's a lot of egg tech companies out there doing a lot of different things that are, that are as I mentioned earlier, innovating and accelerating traditional farming. Um, so that next stage is autonomous, right? The, the GPS system in the machines was introduced 20 years ago. And so the natural course is that, you know, technology is going to have to continue to, to innovate on the farm. There's been a lot of focus on on-road vehicles. And so now looking at the farm, um, naturally it's going to become um, autonomous. But with regards to marketing, we just have to tread lightly because we also don't want to scare um, farmers. Uh, and a lot of the ones that we work with are very progressive and they're very tech forward and knowledgeable. But we also don't want to get to the point where, you know, we're, we're conveying a message um, or talking about um, autonomous equipment, but then taking away from, you know, their grassroots connection. So you know, they, they pride themselves on working hard. They pride themselves on everything that they do. And so, you know, it's our job to educate them on what our product does, um, but then also hold their hand through the steps of getting to uh, automation. Because if we just jump all the way there, um, you know, we're missing the components of, 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 as Godard said, breaking down the individual tasks and the value associated to um, creating more efficient ways of doing that. And then it'll play its natural course as it becomes more accepted in market because we're still in the early adoption stages in, in various elements. But once it becomes more uh, common practice that you know the robotics and the machineries and the drones and everything are gonna be running a lot of those farm decisions, um, 
you know, it'll become more adopted or easily adopted um, in, in all areas. So we talk about, and Godard will get into this, um, how we're a complementary product to this transition into into autonomous world. But we do tread lightly right now because we're 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 trying to talk about it, but not um, also put ourselves in a position where that's that's all we are doing and that's all we're focusing on because it's it's exponential the value that we have across the entire um, farming operation. Well, I guess, Godard, that leads me to a, a question as autonomous becomes more mainstay. I mean, and it, it, it's here in some ways and, and going to be much further expanded. You talked, you know, that one, two, you know, one, two step process. How important will it be? Will the will the capabilities become more complex as sort of you see that the users become more educated on how to do it? Or is the goal to keep it being a simple process so that that it gets easily integrated? I don't know if I'm making sense with that question, but if you could try to touch on it a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I think, you know, our, our purpose statement probably answers that question in a simple way, right? Uh, we call it our massive transformative purpose, which is accelerating the transition to autonomous farming, right? And, and that says it's, it's a process, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the, the big OEMs and you know, some of the smaller autonomous tractor manufacturers, um, they have been focusing on getting the fundamentals right, which is you know, solving machine awareness issues and making the tractors self, uh, you know, implementing self-driving capability on a tractor. But once that's solved, the next set of problems before we can truly enable autonomous farming is going to be figuring out how decisions can be made. How can you translate infield decisions that are made today into mm-hmm. autonomous operations? Uh, and, and that involves you know, not just farmer decisions, capturing the farmer decisions, but also executing those farmer decisions through path planning. That's why we believe the path to autonomy starts with our product launch pad. You know, we, we find ourselves being that missing piece in the autonomous puzzle where our planning software is helping farmers manage their land and equipment to efficiently and remotely execute field operations. So we're not far away from a world where farmers will collaborate and interact with their fields and equipment like they always used to, but without actually entering them, right? But it is a slow transition, right? You need to start with adoption of basic automation, like uh, you know, equipment with auto steer and high precision guidance that provides some real time automation. And then you need to transition to something that we call, you know, supervised autonomy, where the person sitting in the cab is not really focused on operating the equipment, but really making sure that nothing horrible happens, right? But the equipment's kind of driving itself. Um, and when it gets to turns, you're, you're focusing on the turn being perfect and getting to the next pass. So you're doing some kind of supervision, but you're not really operating the equipment. And then comes full autonomy, where you're not even in the field. You know, a future farmer could be sitting in an office building or in the comfort of their house and visually logging in and saying, okay, here's my field. I'm able to see my field as clearly as I could if I actually entered it, right? So you've digitally characterized the field with data that, okay, these are my boundaries. These are where my obstacles are. I know the height and depth of obstacles. Um, And I can now add equipment and figure out how they move around in that field. So that's why today we are focused on simplifying farm planning to reduce infield decision-making. Because when, when that happens and you're making most of the decisions beforehand, then, it doesn't matter whether the agriculture equipment is manned or fully autonomous. We can help farmers execute their field operations, even when they aren't within physical proximity to the, to their fields. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing. I was thinking while you were, were you were talking, I was thinking if I if I watch the uh, if I watch the news, I get uh, I get a little bit stressed out. I actually can't even watch it before I come on and do these shows, or I can't do a proper interview. Um, but when I sit here and listen to this type of just just seeing human innovation, the care people have for the environment, and trying to do better, and then yeah, what you're you know, Lindsay's touched on, it, you've touched on it about trying to collaborate and work through that process so that, you know, you're bringing farmers along with you. And it's, it's, it's actually, uh, it's very inspiring. And it, uh, you know, I, I understand why they can't run this on, on TV, because it's a lot of information that maybe not relate to a lot of people. 
but uh, it's, it's definitely encouraging to our listeners and quite inspiring. So I just want to thank you both for coming on the show and, and I hope we get to have you back on and sort of update as I, I know the company is going to continue to expand. Great. Neil. Thanks for having us on the show. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you everybody for watching. Uh, we'll have plenty of uh, links to Verge Egg and uh, please make sure to check out their LinkedIn and their website and get in touch with them. If there's some collaboration that you see uh, as an opportunity um, and please keep on supporting our show. We, we appreciate it. Please keep suggesting guests. So many of our guests nowadays come from people suggesting and reaching out to us. So we really do appreciate that. And please keep, uh, keep us, keep helping us bring you more content. We will see you on the next episode of Crownsman Egg.